And also, I remember that God is my reward. His joy is my strength. And I remind myself that I don't have to look for a reward from other people or things. Now, this verse encourages me to keep my eyes on Christ. Because, you know, as human beings, I don't know about you, but sometimes you get discouraged and say so someone didn't say this or, and then you tend to go into self-pity, which is not right. And God reminded me, I am your reward. Thank you for tuning in to the Removing Barriers podcast. I'm Jay. And I'm MCG. And we're attempting to remove barriers so we can all have a clear view of the cross. This is episode 42 of the Removing Barriers podcast. And this is the eighth in the series of How Were Your Barriers Removed? In this episode, we will find out how honor barriers were removed when she came to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Crossflix is a family-friendly channel with thousands of Christian films including Christian movies, new releases, documentaries, and educational content. You can access the videos through their digital streaming network anytime, day or night. Whenever you watch a Christian video from Crossflix, you can feel confident that your family is watching inspiring, uplifting content that is clean and curated. For a limited time, Crossflix is available for the first 30 days for free, and you can cancel anytime, no questions asked. That's right. Get access to thousands of free Christian movies and Christian music online right now with your 30-day trial. Click on the link in the description section of this podcast to get Crossflix today. Anna, welcome to the Removing Barriers podcast. Thank you for having me. Great. We just want to know all about you, where you were born, where you're from. So tell us, what state or country were you born in? I was born in India, in the city of Chennai. And the old name for Chennai was Madras. So depending on where you are, maybe a young person, you probably heard of Chennai. And if you've been here a while, then you know Madras. Tell me about Chennai or Madaf, is it? Yes, Madras. Tell us about that city. It's one of the four major cities in India. Of course, India has the second largest population in the world, so it is very populated. Nowadays, it has everything you can ask for, even Huggies diapers and everything else. It's just like any big city anywhere in the world. How about cricket? Do you still follow cricket? I used to follow cricket very closely. Till I married Jacob. Uh, oh. He... <laughs> <laughs> he didn't grow up in India as a young person, so he didn't have that same love for cricket. So, you know, you know how it happens. You just do things together. And so I haven't followed cricket closely since. You know what? I'll have you and him come over to watch some Caribbean cricket, some West Indies cricket. <laughs> <laughs> that should be fun. That should be fun. Actually, I don't even know that, but the IPL, the Indian Premier League is going on right now, but they cancel it because of coronavirus. Yes, I so. heard that. Yes. And again, because I don't follow it, I don't keep up. We've been married 37 years, so wow. I don't keep up with all the latest things because of that. But I used to be an avid fan, have scrapbooks and all kinds of things. Are you a big fan of Flash and Tendoka? Uh, <laughs> no, he came much after me. It was Gavaskar when I was growing up. Okay. Tendulkar came much after that. Okay. <laughs> I think West Indies, we had Kali Charan and people like that. Okay. Well. Yes. I love my cricket as well, but you know how it is when you're in the U.S. So what type of family were you born into, Anna? It sounds like you grew up in an area that was urban. And Yes. Okay, so could you describe what your family was like? Were they saved? Were you in a religious household, or a Christian household? What was your family like? Yeah, I was born into a nominal Christian home. My ancestors had been Christians for centuries. Not all saved, but all went to church. Okay. I grew up with my dad and my mom, and I had three brothers. We all grew up together and had a wonderful childhood. And being the only daughter, I had extra special things. And by the grace of God, we were also fairly affluent. So I had a very comfortable life. Define nominal Christian home. What are some of the aspects that make it nominal? Basically, nominal Christian home means they were not saved. I don't think they knew about salvation, but we went to church every Sunday. I went to Sunday school, you know, activities, everything revolved around church. 
So yeah, that kind of a household where praying and reading the Bible was also important. Now they didn't enforce it, but they taught us to do that. So having a form of godliness and kind of denying the power thereof? Absolutely. Absolutely. So you just described what your life was like before salvation, nominal Christian home. Yeah. You know, prayer and reading the Bible and things that are right. essential to the faith. You were taught, but not necessarily enforced. It wasn't really central in your life. Could you describe right. where you were and what it was like the first time you heard the gospel? Let me first tell you a little bit more about my young life, then it'll make more sense. Okay. We went to a church in India that was more like the Anglican church, basically a big Protestant denomination, but it was an Indian church, not an Anglican church, but an Indian church. And our church was pretty big. We had about a thousand members even then. Now it's probably 2,000, oh, wow. just the local church. And as I said, as kids, we went to Sunday school. I even won many prizes in Sunday school for scripture memorization for other things. But as I said, my parents were very religious and involved in the church. We never missed church. In fact, if we missed church, people would come home asking, you know, what happened? Were you sick or something? Wow. So, and my parents are very social people too. So our social life also revolved around church and church members. Usually we were the last ones to leave church. <laughs> you know, just talking to everybody, that was just the way we grew up. Mm -hmm. And our parents encouraged us to read the Bible and pray. Actually, they taught us to pray. That was our first introduction to prayer. But they were not saved because the message of salvation was not clearly presented in the church. Okay. The church would never deny the plan of salvation. If you presented it to them, they'd say, yeah, all that is true. But they never emphasized it. And they didn't think that salvation was a one-time event. They, you know, repeated the right. creed every week. Okay. We believe in one God, you know, that kind of thing. And I do believe that there were some saved people at church, but that was because they sought the Lord on their own, not because salvation was emphasized in church. Now, to be fair, I'm told that things are quite different now in that particular local church, not necessarily the denomination. Because some of the saved people, including my brother, have brought in outside speakers to speak about salvation and things like that. So there have been more people saved there. Now, that doesn't mean that everyone is saved or that it comes from the pulpit, you know, every week. Our parents taught us what they knew to be involved in church, pray and read the Bible, be morally upright and lead disciplined lives. So I had the idea that even though Jesus died for my sins, when I die, God would weigh my good and my bad. And if my good deeds outweighed my bad deeds, then I would go to heaven. So you see, it wasn't clear, although they taught us about Jesus and his sacrifice and all those things. Mm -hmm. And then you asked me the first time I heard the gospel, was that your question? Yes, because I imagine that if you grew up in a church where there was a lot of religious activity and a lot of the going to church and it was a habit. You're living moral and disciplined lives. I would imagine that if someone were to present the gospel and say, hey, that's not how you get saved. This is how you get saved. Most people would be like, huh, what are you talking about? I live a moral life. So was it in church? Was that the first time you heard the gospel or where did you hear the gospel and how did it affect you when you heard it? The truth is, I really can't answer that question. Okay. Because I really don't remember that. I think my understanding of the gospel was progressive. I don't think anyone presented it at one time. I got peace at a time. Right. And it all came together. When I talk about my salvation, I'll say how it all came together. But I think my understanding of the gospel was a peace at a time, not all together one time. Yeah, I can totally understand that. I have a very similar testimony. I can't think of one time where I've heard the gospel and I responded. It was very much progressive. And every time the Lord taught me something new, you know, I was able to, like you said, piece it together and realize, oh, this is what salvation is. Yeah, I can totally exactly. understand that. Right, right. Yes. Do you remember the first time that you come to the full realization of your sin, that your sin kind of smacked you in the face and say, hey, you're a sinner, you're in need of a savior. Do you remember that first time? or when you first came to the full realization of that? See, growing up, I knew that my aunt, my mom's sister, was different. I knew she was closer to the Lord. 
She prayed a lot. And I knew she had a strong relationship with Jesus. Her conversations always brought that out. And I knew that one day I wanted to be like her, but not yet. One day that will happen, but not right now. However, as a teenager, I went through a rough couple of years. My parents were very strict. And that was the way it was in India at that time. You can't afford to get a bad name. You know, everyone was looking at you. And so you had to be so proper, you know, and so, but I never understood that. And they were trying to protect me. But as a teenager, because I didn't understand that, there was a lot of disagreement between us. And I was unhappy. It was at that time that God got a hold of my heart. And one night when I was in bed, I was not asleep. He told me that if I gave my life to him, he would take care of me and give me the joy that I was seeking. Actually, I cried all night. And by daybreak, I surrendered my life to Christ. I did not fully understand exactly all that was entailed in that, but I did not care. I knew that Jesus would lead me and that he would take care of me, and I was prepared to follow him. What were those barriers that were preventing you from coming to Jesus Christ? And also, what was it exactly that you were wrestling with all night? Was it a question of whether or not you gave up friends or your lifestyle? Explain on that a little bit more. Yes. My first barrier that prevented me from going to Christ is the fact that the gospel was not clearly presented. Okay. So for a long time, I really didn't understand God's plan of salvation. So that was the first barrier. Secondly, I had the mistaken idea that once you give your life to Christ, then life will really be boring Mm -hmm. and that I wouldn't get to enjoy different things in life. And that's why I said to myself, I will be like my aunt one day and I would give my life to Jesus, but not right now. And at that time, the age of 60 seemed like very old. Okay. And so I said, Lord, when I'm 60, I'll think about these things. (laughs) Little did I know after (laughs) I got saved and I was saved at 19. I wish I had gotten saved earlier. Mm. I just wanted to enjoy life. You know, my parents were so strict. They wouldn't let me do that. I'm like, gosh, if I come to Jesus, I lose everything. I mean, I lose everything. I gain heaven. I knew I'd gain heaven. But heaven didn't seem so attractive at that time, you know, as a teenager. I mean, heaven alone. Let me put it like that. Right. Heaven alone. Yeah, that kind of thing. Okay. I was going to tag on a question to what you said about how heaven alone didn't seem all that exciting, although it would be great to go to heaven, but you were worried that coming to Christ would cause you to lead a boring life. Did you realize immediately how wrong you were? Like after salvation, do you realize? Oh, absolutely. Okay. I was going to ask, did it take time for you to realize or was it immediate? No, no. I just was like, how crazy was I? (laughs) You know? Right. I mean, it was totally different. My life was totally different. And I just couldn't imagine why I didn't do that earlier because what I was seeking, I wasn't getting. On top of that, I get to go to heaven, both. Right. You know, that's like <laughs> a double scoop of ice cream, not just one. Not just one. <laughs> yeah. You said that heaven alone wasn't attractive enough. And that kind of sparked something in my mind because a lot of times we go out, we evangelize and we present people heaven. You know, you get a chance to go to heaven. Forgetting the most important part about heaven is not the pearly gates and the streets of gold, is the fact that Jesus is there. Right. And mm-hmm. the fact that you came to Jesus, you know, you are right. Heaven alone is not enough. It's the fact that yeah. Jesus died for you and he's there. You're going to be with him forever. Yeah. Is what make heaven heaven, not the golden exactly. street and all those things. He's the pearl of great price. Definitely. Absolutely. Did you tell us how were those barriers eventually removed? You mentioned the barrier of not having a clear gospel presentation, wanting kind of to have fun. Wrap it up and tell us, how did those barriers actually get removed for you? I was very unhappy trying to enjoy the life I wanted to enjoy. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I love my parents, but we could never agree on anything. And, you know, it was just always this and that. And I reached a very low point in my life. You know, it wasn't like I was doing something really terrible, you know what I'm saying? But especially in the light of what, things that are happening nowadays with people go through. But it was in the 70s. And, you know, 
I grew up in India and everyone was very strict about things. And in my mind, it was like, no, this is not what life's supposed to be. And so it was a very low point. And then God brought me to an understanding that true joy is found only in him. Yes, heaven is because of his mercy on me, but he gives me true joy even here. He's going to be part of my life here. He will never leave me. And he'll give me peace and joy right here, even before I get to heaven. You're listening to the Removing Barriers podcast. We are talking with Anna and finding out how were her barriers removed. We'll be right back. Do you have the desire to earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints? Answers in Genesis can help. They provide biblically sound books, CDs, DVDs, homeschooling materials, VBS materials, online courses, digital downloads, and The Answers Magazine, and more. Plus, tickets to the Creation Museum and Ark Encounter. Go to The Answers Bookstore by clicking the link in the description section below, so you too can be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks the reason of the hope that is in you. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So Anna, after salvation, what changes were evident in your life? You touched on it a little bit before the break. Could you elucidate and explain how your life changed after salvation? Oh, I was a totally different person. I was in college at that time. And everyone who knew me noticed the change. My classmates, friends, siblings, even my parents. First of all, I went to find a classmate of mine. Her name is Ramola, who I thought before I got saved, I thought she was the most boring young person. (laughs) And the reason was every time she had a few minutes, she will pull out, you know, the small red Gideon's Bible. You know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She had that in her purse all the time. She'd pull it out. Even, you know, a short break, she'll be reading that. I'm like, boy, does this girl have nothing to do except read her Bible? (laughs) I should think of that. You know, I knew she was very close to the Lord, but I really didn't want to be like her. But, you know, the morning I got saved, the first person I went to and looked for was Ramola. I found her and I told her how I had given my life to Christ, you know, and she was so excited. We became best of friends. And for the next year and a half, not officially, but unofficially, she discipled me Mm. till we graduated. She was my discipler. And she brought a lot of things to my understanding that I did not clearly understand. I knew I'd given my life to Christ and I was willing to follow him, whatever the truth was. You know, she taught me a lot of stuff. Secondly, the focus of my life changed. It was all about Jesus. I knew Jesus would lead me and he would guide me and I depended on him. I was confident in the Lord and I had the joy and the peace that he promised me. No, it's not that everything went my way all the time, but God was very careful to make sure that he was so gentle with me that I enjoyed everything. You know, if it didn't go, he still encouraged me. If it didn't go my way, you know, he still encouraged me. And although I prayed and read the Bible before, like I said, Now it was not a task. I enjoyed doing it, you know, and I knew I was talking to the one who loved me and the one whom I loved. Amen. Also, my friends changed. I now thoroughly enjoyed the company of other believers. And to tell you the truth, I did not enjoy the company of my old unsafe friend. Although many of them were morally upright people, many of them were Hindus. So I really didn't have, I mean, we had church friends, but they were nominal Christians. Then I had college friends, which, you know, were all different faiths, morally upright people. But, you know, we didn't see things the same way. I did talk to them. I didn't run away from them. I did talk to them. But both of us knew, they and I knew that it was not the same. And slowly we drifted apart. Another change was that I always wanted to witness to others and lead them to Christ. I wanted to tell them, especially my family, I knew as religious as they were, they were all lost, you know, and so I wanted to lead them to Christ. Actually, I told God, and my dad was a heart patient. I said, God, you cannot take my dad 
till he gets saved. Mm-hmm. You can take him any time, but he's got to get saved. So God kept him a long time. He was 82 when he passed away. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. So my life was totally different. How did your relationship with your parents change? Because you said you're very, I don't know if rebellious is the right term, but maybe disruptive teen. How did your life change after you get saved with your parents? Oh, of course, they noticed the difference and they just couldn't believe it. Of course, they thought I'd gone off the deep end. You said you went from one extreme to the other extreme. I told, <laughs> I told them there's no two ways with Christ. Either you're with him or you're not with him. Amen. There's no in between. But yes, our relationship changed quite a bit. You know, I saw things their way. They saw things my way, you know, and actually my mom became my best friend after that. Of course, I said, I will only marry a saved man. And she said, you're not going to find anyone like that. There's no one like that. But the Lord knew better. And he had someone in mind. (laughs) Be be careful, your husband listening. Don't get a big head behind there. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Yes. Do you think the way your barriers were removed would be effective in reaching the culture of today? As I said, my barrier was lack of a proper understanding of two things. The completed work of Christ on the cross on my behalf. And the fear of losing out on the pleasures of this life if I gave my life to Christ. Yes, there are several people that are religious and go to church, but they don't know Christ. And there are even some others who know the Bible quite a bit or, you know, but they do not know the God of the Bible. Knowing what I know now, I can clarify doubts and I can tell them there is a difference between knowing the Bible or going to church and knowing Christ. And I think I'll be able, if, you know, given an opportunity, I would be able to show them the difference. Also, I feel that I can encourage people who keep putting salvation off to a later date. I can encourage them to make a decision for Christ sooner because of what happened to me and sharing with them the riches I obtained in Christ when I got saved. And also, we never know if we will have another chance. If we keep putting it off, we don't know when the last day will be. But instead of, you know, confronting them with that difficult thought that they may never have a chance again, telling them that, you know, there's so much to gain in Christ. It's not what you think it is. It's a very rich life that we have in Christ. And I think that way I'll be able to help them move their barriers or remove their barriers from coming to Christ so that they can come to Christ. You sound so passionate about talking to people about the Lord and seeing them come to Christ. Can you explain to us and tell us what different things are you doing personally in the area of evangelism to help remove barriers that exist in the lives of others? you know, similar to the barriers that you experienced before salvation. What are you doing in the area of evangelism to help people through those barriers? Well, what I'm doing is a drop in the bucket. But first of all, I try to live a life that God wants me to live. You know, once you say you're a Christian or born again, then people look at your life with a magnifying glass. Okay. And if our life doesn't match what we are saying, no one wants to listen to us. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this doesn't mean I'm perfect, far from it, but rather, uh, you know, I want to have short accounts with God and spend time at his feet so I can be the person he wants me to be. And when I mess up, go to him and ask for forgiveness. And if others see me mess up, so be it. I mean, I tell them that, you know, that, yeah, I messed up. And so people can see that you are genuine in your relationship with Christ. That's the first thing. But that doesn't save people. That alone will not save people. So I try to share the gospel with others, especially people that God has put in my life. Not that it is limited to that, but I mean, God puts people in my life that he will not put in your life. And so I feel like, you know, people have come into my life for a reason. So I try to share the gospel with them. And things have changed after the pandemic hit us in March. In some ways, even for the better, I'm able to do Bible studies on Zoom, two of them with individual ladies. And the other two are with small groups of six to eight people. And my husband and I do the group Bible studies together. We chose the book of Romans because the gospel is very clearly presented in that book. And see, church-going people, if you tell them, oh, you want to study a book in the Bible, 
they're more interested than if I tell them, oh, this is the way to salvation. They think they already know a whole bunch. Mm. I found that they're more willing to study a book in the Bible because it seems like, okay, we're doing a Bible study. And so in the process, as they study the book of Romans after the third or fourth chapter, they're presented with the idea that they are sinners, just like I am a sinner. And all of us have to you know, come to Christ for salvation. So it's a nice way to lead them to the gospel instead of me preaching to them, just showing them what the Bible has to say. And of course, you know, you go through the entire book of the Bible. And this, because of Zoom, I feel that we can reach people not just who are close to us physically, both the group Zoom meetings are with people that are not close by in Texas, Philadelphia, even in India, different parts. Oh, wow. That's interesting because, Mm -hmm. you know, we can take the technology of today and reach a lot of people. You know, one thing that always on my mind and I guess would be one of kind of my most convicted verses is when the Bible says in Acts chapter 17 that those who have turned the world upside down have come here also. And I always think about it because these men use primitive technology, primitive way of transportation, yet they were able to turn their world upside down for Christ. And the question begs me is that why is it that I cannot turn my world upside down for Christ with all the technology I have? You know, I remember when I was traveling from Papua New Guinea to Los Angeles, we left Papua New Guinea on Sunday morning and we arrived in Los Angeles the preceding Saturday night. Uh Uh, And just, just think about that, the fact that you already experienced Sunday, then you go back to Saturday. It's weird, but the technology of today makes it so amazing that you can fly across the international dateline in a few hours and you go back to a previous day. We have so, yes. our technology is so vast, but yet, in my opinion, we're doing so much less than what the apostles were able to do. So right. I'm really glad that you're using the technology and the resources that are available to you to actually spread the gospel, even in a time like COVID like this. Amen. Praise God, because God convinced me, you know, that, you know, you can't wait for things to be perfect because there will never be a perfect time and that you just do what you have to do. Uh, if you're doing door to door visitation, it may not be possible at this time, but God has another way. And we just have to, you know, ask God for what his way is. Even now, I don't want to do another Zoom session unless he leads me because it's not about me doing the Bible study. It's about people coming to Christ. Amen. If it isn't the path that, or the people that God has brought to me, then it's just another Bible study. Right. Yeah. So Anna, you described the things that you're doing personally in the area of evangelism. And I think that's phenomenal. I think that's wonderful. Praise God for that. Amen. Because how else would you have reached them? You know, how else yeah. would they have heard? You know, I think yes. that's really great. And so you must have certain scriptures or maybe certain passages in the Bible that really touch you, motivate you. Sometimes perhaps you keep referring to these passages or maybe to a particular scripture. Do you have a favorite or do you have a favorite set of passages in the Bible that just do something special to encourage you or to convict you or motivate you? I don't have one verse because I have so many (laughs) and they keep changing (laughs) as the Lord, you know, what I do as the Lord speaks. Depends. I write it at the back of my notebook. Sometimes I write it on index cards and then, you know, I put it on the fridge or, you know, have a stack of them. And so it keeps changing. Right now, one of the verses I'm holding on to is Genesis 15, 1. It's God's word to Abraham, but it applies to me too. And I personalize the Bible verses and put my name in them. And God's words to Abraham was, and to me is, Fear not, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. I remember he is my protection, not just physically, but spiritually, emotionally, and mentally. And so I should not fear. See, as a person, I'm a person that fears, but I have, you know, with God's help, you overcome these things. I think as a child, I was more, even though I grew up in a good home and everything, I tend towards being pessimistic simply because. Then if something good happens, I would trick my mind to say that. If I think the bad thing, then if the good thing happens, I'd be happy. Crazy, but that's the way I thought. And so right now, you know, I felt God speaking to me saying, fear not, I am thy shame and thy exceeding great reward. 
I also remember that God is my reward. His joy is my strength. And I remind myself that I don't have to look for a reward from other people mm. or things. This verse encourages me to keep my eyes on Christ and not on people. Because, you know, when we expect things from people, and I'm very guilty of it too, too. you know, expect someone to say something or do something, and then we get disappointed. Mm -hmm. Even in evangelism, when I look at Christ, you witness to somebody and they don't accept Christ. You've done the whole Bible study and they still say, oh, I'm not sure. I have to look at Christ and say, you are my reward. Mm -hmm. You know everything that's happening. My joy comes from you and not looking elsewhere. And this verse helps me refocus when I falter. And again, this is just one of the many, many verses it just happens to be one on my fridge right now. <laughs> yeah, man, that's such a blessing. What about a favorite Bible history, sometimes you refer as story? Do you have a favorite account in the Bible that you really like? Not necessarily, but I can give you a couple of people. One is I love David. God called him a man after his own heart. I would love for God to say that about me. Mm. You know, yes, he did some of the most terrible things, and I wouldn't want anyone to do those things. But when he was confronted, he didn't blame anyone. He acknowledged it. He was humble, repented. And also his life after that completely changed. Obviously, that's why God called him a man after his own heart. God knew his heart. I want God to think of me that way. Of course, my heart needs to be that way too. The other person I love is Paul. I can identify with him, not because I'm anywhere close to him, but because he was going the wrong way, his own way, and thinking that was the best way. And that's what I was doing, thinking, oh, my way is going to bring me happiness, you know, until Jesus stopped him in his track. And after that, Paul was totally surrendered to God. And he loved the Lord. He spent the rest of his days preaching the gospel and desiring to draw everyone to Christ. Now, as you mentioned earlier, so much, so much God accomplished through him because he was totally yielded to God. I mean, I'd love for God to use me to draw many to him. And that's my prayer show. So these are two characters that I really love. A lot more people, but if I were to condense them, then these two would stand out. Amen. You know, when I asked you if you had a favorite scripture or verse, you talked about how it changes often. That's because the scriptures tell us that, right? The word of God is living, it's powerful, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. So it speaks to us differently depending on what's going on in our lives because the Lord is constantly working on us, whittling away the flesh and building the inner man up. And so right. I wonder when it comes to scripture passages that convict you, would you say the same thing about those as well, that they change depending on what's yes, happening? Or is there, okay. They do, because there are so many, and God is so good, because depending on my need, He will convict me <laughs> <laughs> appropriately, right? But I can give you one passage that convicts me, and that is First John 2, 15 and 16. It says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Mm. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. I mean, that's a convicting one all time, you know. But there's so many others that God convicts me from time to time. I'm far from perfect. There's a lot of work. I'm still his workmanship. A lot to be done. You know, Amen. yeah, you're absolutely right. When I asked you the first question about the scripture that God is using in your life right now, you pointed to Genesis and how God was telling Abraham that, you know, fear not, I am your exceeding great reward. And then you went to explain it in terms of, you know, not looking to people for that reward. Our reward comes from the Lord. And even as you were speaking, Anna, I was convicted because how many times will I, I don't know, do something around the house and just, you know, well, no one appreciates what I do around here or, yeah. you know, and just meditating on the wrong thing. And even as you were speaking it, as you were explaining that verse, even I was convicted. Do you see how the Lord's God. God. word works? So yeah, that's really awesome. Do you have a favorite hymn of the faith? Uh, <laughs> there's no one hymn, but I love this hymn, As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul panteth after thee. So I love that hymn. 
but I love a lot of hymns. <laughs> <laughs> May that be true uh, of all of us. Maybe give us another one. Uh, at Calvary. Oh, okay. um, my kids love yeah. that one. Yeah, they were great. Yeah, were great. Yeah. What about your favorite giant of the faith? I think that might be David and Paul, but yes, I guess so. Yeah. Yes, especially Paul and Peter. He hung upside down. I mean, sometimes you say things you <laughs> you shouldn't be saying. Put a foot in the mouth, kind of thing, it. right? Right, right. And so all of them. I mean, where am I? I'm a little worm compared to any of them. You know. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's amazing how many folks we have interviewed in the series. How were your barriers removed? that they mention David as someone they look up to. And as I mentioned in a previous episode, you know, if I would choose someone, you know, blindly to say, you know, this person was someone after God's own heart, I would say maybe Daniel, maybe Joseph. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't choose David. David was a murderer, an adulterer, but God chose him and said he was a man after God's own heart. And that's encouragement for all of us because, you know, if David could be a man after God's own heart, we too... I believe can become a person after God's own heart if we do exactly imitate what David have done. Right. So Anna, we want to give you the floor pretty much to just share your heart with the audience. If you would like to explain to them how can barriers to salvation be removed? What would you say to someone that is struggling with perhaps not wanting to give up this life for Christ? Even as you were saying that, I was thinking of my brother. He knows the gospel message clearly, and we've presented to him many times, but he knows that if he comes to Christ, He's going to have to let go of the drinking and the partying, all the life that he's living now. You explained how, though you weren't drinking or doing anything crazy like that, but just, you know, the pleasures of this life, yeah. those will have to be left behind. So we're going to give you the floor, give you an opportunity to share your heart with the audience when it comes to barriers, when it comes to the gospel. What would you like the audience to know and hear from your heart? Well, the truth is people don't know what Christ did for them and who Christ is. That's the thing. They may go to church and you talked about your brother. I have three brothers. Two of them are saved, but one is not. And he's exactly in the same position as your brother. Mm. And I've been trying to get him to listen to the Zoom, you know, from the word of God, what does God say, you know, and who God is. If people come to a realization of how loving and how wonderful God is, then they would want to come to him. So I would say that I am no better than anybody else. In God's eyes, all of us, even David, we talked about a murderer, an adulterer, and even the best person on earth, you know, all of us are sinners in God's eyes. And we can never pay the debt that we owe to find our way into heaven. But God loved us so much that he was willing to come down as God the Son, God the Father sent God the Son to die for us and take my punishment. And he promised us, and if we repent and place our complete trust in him, that he will give us eternal life, abundant life. It's not just life in heaven, which is wonderful because God will be there and Jesus will be there. And that will be the greatest thing. But even our mind's eye at this point may not be able to see what heaven is like, but we can understand peace and joy and love 
and a great life here on earth. And God gives us just that. Money is not the thing that's going to make us happy. We want money because we think it's going to make us happy. You know, the things in life are not going to make us happy. We need a few of those things to be able to live. You know, definitely we do need that. And I'm not denying that. But the things that God can give us, the true happiness, the true joy, the true things that our hearts are craving can only come from Christ. And so if you will realize that you are a sinner and that Christ was willing to die for you so that you could have that life, then if you truly understand that, you would give your life to Christ. And that's exactly what happened to me. And that nobody, not even the best of us, can earn our way to heaven not by what we do. And it's so simple. In fact, it's so simple, even a child can understand it. Just Mm -hmm. like a child will look up to its daddy or mommy, you know, for security when there's so many dangers around. In the same way, we can depend on Christ totally for our salvation first, and then for an abundant life here on earth. And so I would say to anyone that is struggling with the thought that they are losing out on life, that they have it all wrong, that they don't understand. If they would just give God the chance, and if they would like to see what God has to say, look in the scriptures. That's what Jesus said. My word will never pass away. Heaven and earth will pass away. My word will never pass away. And in his word, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except through me. So he is the only way, and he gives us abundant life. And so it is faith and trust in him that will give us what we are truly desiring. Anna, thank you for joining us on the Removing Barriers podcast. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Thank you for listening. To get a hold of us or to support this podcast, go to anchor.fm forward slash removing barriers this has been the removing barriers podcast we attempted to remove barriers so that we all can have a clear view of the cross